welcome everybody. The, uh, I think as many of you know, the UK micro cap and small cap sectors produce some of the best long term investments um, and opportunities for investors from the UK spot market. But what it really requires is a long term investment horizon and a patient, patient approach from the fund managers. So to discuss some of the issues, I'm joined by Judith, I was going to say Judith Downing, <laughs> Judith McKenzie, um, the head of funds at uh, Downing Investment Management and her colleague Nick Hawthorne, who together run two of the microcap strategies. So uh, Judith, Nick, welcome. Hi there. Hi there. Good to see you both. Thank you very much for joining me um, in, uh, in these interesting times. Uh, in fact, they always are in sort of stock market sort of terms. Um, I mean, probably Judith to you sort of first. Um, what would you say, I mean, because we do live clearly in kind of challenging economic and uh, kind of uh, medical um, environment not just for the uk but obviously sort of globally as we're talk talking at the moment um what would you say the opportunity is now in kind of U uk micro cap and sort of um, and small cap volatility does throw out some really interesting opportunities and we're finding that we can invest in companies that are pretty much half the price that they were maybe just back in january mm. so you get good quality companies decent balance sheets that you can look through and see that um, they're going to be survivors after this so it, it's, a, it's, it's very much an interesting time. But as you say, you've got to be a long-term investor here. And Nick, I think you've got a slide um, that you can show that, that shows why at this point in the cycle, it could be quite interesting to, to be dipping your toe in. <laughs> yeah, we, we like small caps, um, you know, because the, the valuation anomaly is down at, at the centre of, of the space. And we think that those valuation anomalies are particularly wide just now. So... Uh, smaller caps are, are a much larger discount to to larger caps. Um, so uh, you know, as we can see in the slide, uh, you can see how the, the the smaller end of that small cap space is at a significant discount. Um, so you know, we think over the long term that will uh, benefit the the investors in this fund. Um, why does that occur? We think that that's due to the inefficiency in the small cap space uh, that is there's far fewer analysts looking at these companies um, you know certainly post mifid we think that this has become a much larger issue in the small cap space and the quality uh, of the information on these companies mm -hmm. is, uh, is is much lower than it used to be and certainly in, in this time in this covid situation we think that that uh, quality is is even worse than it has been in the past um, you know, analyst spending less time uh, on, on smaller companies, less time pissing out you know, genuine thought pieces on smaller companies and, uh, and instead just choosing to kind of type up or, or change the wording of the, the announcements that companies put out. So uh, you know, we think that that is a, a sustainable advantage for us in this uh, in, in the small cap space. Um, and again, as, as we know, over the long term, small caps outperform and small cap value outperforms. And we think that uh, yeah, in, a t in times like this, we want to be positioned into, into value opportunities, which is where the fund has always been and, and where it always will be. Um, and, uh, and that should stand us in quite a good position. Again, taking, as Judith said, taking a long term view, uh, the performance of, of the fund should uh, benefit once we come out the other side of this. Thanks, Nick. Um, and, and let's just, just um, Judith, if, if I can pick up on a, a couple of the um, the points that Nick was uh, was making there, and um, very much into the context of kind of what is the expertise that Downing brings. Clearly, the business has got a uh, a longer term heritage in the sort of uh, private equity um, VCT space. People will be very familiar with. Uh, the long-term performance of the Downing VCTs. So presumably you're taking a lot of this kind of research um, on the grounds, company specific, um, uh, looking at things that you're taking into the open-ended fund that we're, we're sort of talking about today. We've got both private and uh, public equity experience in the team. And, uh, and it's maybe a little bit cliched, but using that kind of private equity experience applied to the public markets, and especially in this area, is actually uh, quite key because we find that the businesses that we're investing in, they are far more like private companies than, than really uh, grown up public ones. Mm. Uh, so we've got to get involved in some of the governance aspects, we've got to get involved in sometimes restructuring. 
so you've got to be quite hands on. You've expanded the team as a group. You've got Rosemary Banyard with you now, Anthony sort of Eaton, in addition to to both of your sort of cells. So you've got you've you've got a lot of experience there, and presumably you're you're sort of sharing ideas and obviously yeah. uh, James James Lynch, who runs uh, the, the monthly income fund. That's right. You know, we've got, so we, we've now got more, more fund managers than we ever have. And actually at a time when, um, you know, we're, we're in company meetings when, uh, not company meetings, but uh, our, our own team meetings for the first time uh, with both Anthony and Rosemary uh, over the, the course of the last three or four weeks. So it's been a bit, a bit of a baptism of fire, but what we've really found is that we're, um, we're interacting very well. We've got... Um, We've got a couple of meetings every week that are quite key. We, we catch up every single Monday morning and we look at the week ahead and there's a lot of interaction between James, Nick, Josh, myself and Rosemary. Anthony, obviously, with the Global Fund is slightly different. Mm. Um, however, he brings in some fantastic experience and good oversight from a macro perspective. So that Monday morning meeting is really a, a good, really a good gossip about the, the week coming and what we think from, from a macro perspective. We then catch up uh, through the week. Uh, we're sharing company meetings with uh, the full team, really. And, uh, and then at the end of the week, we do a bit of a roundup that's more stock specific. Um, so there's a lot of cross-referencing that's going on and, and actually we're really enjoying having both Anthony and Rosemary uh, in the flock. Mm. Now, um, let, let's talk about specifically about the sort of micro cap fund. I mean, the, the long term performance is very good um, by sort of any measure against your peers, against the benchmark, etc., or, or the IAA sector. Alpha. Um, could you just sort of talk about kind of what you attribute the sort of the, sh the shorter term performance to and kind of perhaps more importantly going forward? What, what, what have you what have you done as a as a team to to uh, try and sort of enhance performance? Obviously, the the, the first um, well, the last couple of years uh, we have um, we are value investors, so we're not momentum, and clearly we have underperformed some of those other momentum uh, players that are out there. And we're I suppose we're not really ashamed of that to to an extent because we're not going to change our style. Um, we've also historically had quite a number of what we call strategic positions in, in the fund. And we recycled those around about the end of, sort of 2017 coming into 2018. And with um, strategic holdings, it's a bit like buses when it comes to corporate activity. You either get nothing or, or you get three or four uh, things happening at one time. And that's really what happened uh, just at the tail end of that 2017 period. So we then ended up putting in a, a handful of new strategic positions and what that means is that you have a bit of a J curve and that's certainly what we've experienced. Things tend to get a little bit more difficult before they get better. Um, but what we've now done, and Nick will go into the detail of it, we've diversified that portfolio quite significantly, mainly because we see the market opportunity as opposed to uh, any sort of pressures. But we're now looking at, um, instead of 30 stocks, we're now looking at up to 40, and we've increased the market cap bands as well. So there's quite a lot of change that's gone in that portfolio in the last uh, six months or so. As Judith was saying, um, th that, that open-ended fund uh, had about 60, 65% exposure to those the much longer term, uh, much more illiquid holdings, much more hands-on holdings. Um, and uh, as we, we launched the closed end funds, it, it became you know, fairly obvious that the open ended funds should be able to enjoy you know, a, some, some more positions in terms of numbers. So we took that up to 40, as Judith said, uh, which allows those individual positions to be much, you know, much lower weighting in the fund and, and adds liquidity to the fund. So we, we've taken those kind of core you know, lot, super long term high engagement holdings down to about 25% of the fund, which we think suits it given uh, the liquidity uh, of those holdings. And, uh, and then on the back of that, we've taken a few smaller positions to so adding kind of half percent positions, 1% positions, where we then build conviction over time. So that, you know, the key is not to, you know, perhaps what we've done in the past is take a large position you know, a four or five percent position on day one, but we will take a, a small position on day one, you know, enjoy some of the multiple expansion, 
at the beginning and then as we build conviction we can we can build that into a larger position over time um, as Judith said we've we've taken the market cap bands up a bit so we can invest in, in larger companies we think you know in the markets we're seeing today versus uh, where we were uh, seven years ago when when the fund launched uh, you know there's better value opportunities further up the market cap uh, spans than there were back then um, so, so we think the funds should be able to enjoy uh, those opportunities as well we've got a couple of questions that are coming uh, coming in from our audience um, inevitably uh, Nick mentioned uh, liquidity there liquidity is one hi this is Rohit Vaswani from ABC wealth management can you talk a little bit about uh, liquidity um, how are you currently might maintain liquidity uh, particularly with the open-ended fund um, but also how this is different within the close-ended investment trust. Thank you. Nick, do you want to sort of kick off? So as I said, we're holding more positions and, and those positions tend to be a, a smaller weight. And again, as we're moving up the market cap scale, those positions tend to be more liquid given the size of the fund. Um, you know, I, I guess it always comes back to a question of capacity. Um, the, the fund before when we had you know, when we were looking at 25 to 30 holdings, we always said that had a capacity of about 30 million. Um, we think the fund today, you know, as of today, you know, with the, with the market having fallen 30%, you know, the, the, the mandate today can, can take capacity of up to 40. In a, in a normal market, I would think that could be up to kind of 50 or 60 million. Um, and that's just a function of, again, the, the higher market caps that we're allowed to own, and the, uh, the the larger number of holdings that we can have in the fund as well. And Nick, just following on from that, in terms of liquidity, do you look at it in one of those sort of tests of how long it would take you to liquidate, you know, a, a significant element of the portfolio to cash, for example, as a, as a as a measure of what real liquidity is in the portfolio? Exactly. Yeah. So so we look at uh, yeah how many days to liquidate. The position or you know the, the inverse what percentage of the position position is saleable within one day uh, and we assume that you can take 50 percent of, of the market volume um, so uh, uh, you know again we, we tend to want to manage the positions quite closely um, something that we're doing going forward so you know some of the newer positions that we've added in in the old days of the fund we would have owned a much larger position uh, in those companies. Uh, today, uh, we, want to, we want to own those companies because they're good quality and they're good value, but we want to own them uh, with kind of a, 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 an eye on the liquidity as well. So you know, typically if, if it's gonna take us, or if we could only sell 5% of the position in a day, you know, we want to limit that to about a 1% weight in the fund so that would you know that would imply it takes us 20 days to sell that position mm. uh, and it feels like you know having that a one percent weight kind of manages that liquidity uh, adequately and again you know as the companies get larger uh and uh, and the, the position sizes in the fund get smaller that that liquidity should uh, should benefit the fund going forward and, and Judith, I guess with the closed-ended fund, you're, you, you've got a slightly um, uh, higher exposure to some of these kind of long-term strategic sort of holdings that sort of Nick, Nick sort of touched on. And clearly liquidity is, is not so much of an issue because there's obviously daily liquidity in the underlying stock in the investment trust. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's the right, absolutely the right type of vehicle for that, that mandate. Um, and, and clearly we've seen over the last 18 months or so that uh, the question of liquidity comes up all the time when it comes to an open-ended fund, and especially in that microcap space. So we're very cognizant of that, as Nick has just described. And uh, we've never we've never been a, a frantic asset gatherer in this space because I don't think it's the right thing to do. You can get decent returns, and for a boutique like us, you can, as a fund manager, you can actually get decent returns from the underlying funds uh, that you have uh, under management. So we're not in a rush to. Uh, to, to asset gather in this space. The trust itself is uh, slightly different because it's a concentrated portfolio of up to 18 positions, so completely yeah. different from the open-ended. And we're taking strategic stakes of between uh, 3 and 25% of the underlying equity. And in pretty much every case, there's a bit of a job to be done 
whether it be board changes, restructuring, M&A activity. And they're all slightly different in terms of their, uh, how strategic uh, they are. Some where, um, for instance, I sit on the board and others that are a little bit more hands off, but each one of them has got, got a bit of a job to do or a, a catalyst to, to find. So not really suited, or that mandate, not really suited for an open-ended vehicle, but bang on for the trust. So it, it sounds like the two vehicles um, very much complement each other from an investment perspective. So you've got the sort of, um, you know, three to five year view on the open-ended funds um, with, with obviously an opportunity for, for greater liquidity. And then you've got the kind of long term, um, almost uh, venture capital, private equity style uh, approach that using the investment trust that provides hopefully kind of, um, kind of you know, bigger but longer term uh, returns. Absolutely, and there there is some crossover between the two funds. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's some crossover uh, with James's fund as well, and in our IHT portfolios. And what that means is that you um, you get access to companies where you're taking a really decent uh, chunk of the business, and that uh, that gives you a bit of a passport to um, to be a, a bit more hands on with with businesses. So yeah, the, the the funds do sit very neatly together. Uh, now, this is um, another question that's come in from 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 the audience. Um, uh, is kind of um, to you, sort of Judith. You mentioned um, kind of the value style of investing. Um, what would you say is the kind of most suitable types of environment where um, the style of investing that uh, the pair of you are using for these two mandates, particularly the open-ended funds, kind of works works to the best? Well, I can say that it's certainly not a uh, uh, momentum market. <laughs> we've um, <laughs> not really enjoyed uh, the last couple of years. We've been making what we think are some uh, good value investments and some cracking businesses, but it's just not been, um, it's, the market has not been on receive for that type of investment. So, yeah, very, very much a value bias, but the, the, this mandate tends to actually work quite well in slightly more challenging environments, believe it or not. And that's because we are masters of our own destiny to quite an extent. We're able to ally ourselves with management teams, put in incentives, uh, and actually look to drive corporate activity, which in the end can be the the real nirvana for these types of businesses and where you get your returns. So if I look look back and we're into the track record of um, the the fund itself, Mm. you can see that... uh, you can see around about sort of 20, 2014, the end of 2013 into 2014, when the market really wasn't doing very much, uh, we started making big strides ahead. And then we tracked the market a little bit after that. But it was really that period where uh, we had put in place some of the strategic initiatives within our portfolio, and we started to get a little bit of corporate activity. And that really is where you uh, can start to outperform. So it really it's more to do with, unsurprisingly, the underlying stocks in the portfolio and where they are in their life cycle. That has smoothed out and beginning to smooth out a little bit now with the number of holdings being increased. You'll still be able to get and capture that, uh, that upside in the strategic positions but you get far more diversity within the portfolio and also come in with liquidity. Uh, well, I think uh, nobody would disagree. We certainly uh, are living and investing in sort of challenging times. Um, so uh, sort of finally, um, sort of Judith, um, give us the elevator pitch. So uh, kind of why you UK and small cap now and, and why Downing? Well, we've got the heritage, we've got the track record. Uh, we are probably one of the biggest players by number of fund managers in this space. Uh, probably looking after the smallest amount of money as well, but I think that's a, a good thing. Um, we're not going to asset gather. We're not going to be uh, silly in the way that we uh, manage our business. We want to have this this mandate running for the next twenty years, not the next five years, twenty years plus probably. So we're we're here, and uh, we we absolutely believe in this area of the market. Um, why now? Uh, it's always difficult to time markets, but I think if we look back in three to five years' time. And for investments that are made at this point, I think you know, we're going to generate some really, really good returns. But you do need to be careful, and we've always been quite risk averse. We don't like uh, gearing, we don't, um, we're, we're relatively fortunate that we've not um, been at all exposed to retail and leisure, which I think are going to be sectors when we come out of this that are going to look completely different to uh, the, the world as it was before. 
Uh, we, are, we like boring old uh, UK manufacturing with decent margins that have been around for 100 years and are owned by their, predominantly owned by their management teams. And I think that type of asset over the next five to 10 years and, and certainly three to five years is going to, is going to show that uh, it can generate some fantastic returns. So, um, yeah, be brave um, and put, a, put this type of investment away in your pension fund for the next five years. Well, Judith, Nick, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the, you, the audience, for, uh, for watching in as well. And if you've got any more specific questions for, for either Judith or Nick, uh, if you look at the bottom of the video, there's a, there's a link, there's a way of getting in contact with sort of Downing, uh, and they will come back to you with sort of detailed answers. Uh, from me, Lawrence Gosling, thank you very much for watching.